Good morning. Welcome to Grace, where we bring God's grace to life. Happy New Year to all of you folks at home. Uh, we're so thankful to be able to uh, bring God's Word to you uh, this day. Uh, just a few announcements before we get going. Uh, Grow God's Family, our Sunday Bible study resumes on Sunday the 10th. That's a week from tomorrow at 945 if you're able to do that, we are do doing that both in person and via Zoom. Our men's Bible study resumes on Thursday uh, the 7th at 6.30 in the morning. So if you're inclined to be an early riser and would like a seat at the table, we have more than enough room. So please come and join us. Lifelight begins a new study on Proverbs on Tuesday the 5th at 9.30. And all are welcome. So if you would like to do that. Uh, please do. Offering envelopes are available. As we uh, show God's love, send a card to our shut-ins if you have time and it's on your heart. Uh, these poor folks are uh, locked up because of their frailties and uh, bring some joy into their day. Send a card and share God's love with them. It's your God's life. Uh, www.graceromeo.com. You can find all the information about Grace. You can see our service videos. All of those things you can find at our website. So with that, uh, Terry Bauer, our deacon, will be proclaiming God's word to us today as we look at Luke chapter 2 in the boy Jesus uh, in the temple. So we will begin our worship now, and we begin our worship and our call to worship from Psalm 147. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How good it is to sing praises to our God. Praise, Praise the, the Lord. Lord. Great is the Lord and mighty in power. The Lord delights in those who fear Him, who put their hope in Him and His unfailing love. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I pray for you and for all people today that you would help us to grow in wisdom as you had your son Jesus do in the temple. We pray that you would be with us, that you would let your peace rest upon us this coming year. We pray for all of our young people that they would uh, seek you out, that they would uh, grow in wisdom and knowledge of, of your word, that they would delight in being in service uh, to you and to your people. We pray your blessing upon our worship here today in Jesus' name, amen. We now join together in our opening song, Angels from the Realms of Glory.
And now we have the privilege of coming before a Lord in a time of confession where we leave our sins at the foot of the cross and we re- hear God's sweet words of forgiveness. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against You and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. And we now join together in our Christmas Alleluia. turn our hearts and minds to God's Word. Our first reading today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm number 119, beginning in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. And I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of Luke, the second chapter beginning in verse 40, and this will be the basis for today's message. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, 
The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. And we now affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And it's now that we come before our Lord in a time of offering, giving him thanks for the many manifold blessings that he showers upon us daily. Uh, Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would continue to bless us and that the blessings that you shower upon us, we would share and reach out to others. Please accept these offerings to be used for your kingdom work here at Grace, in our community, and in our world. And it's in your son's strong name we pray. Amen. And now we go to the Lord in prayer for the prayers of the church. Today our list is long and the needs are many, and we'll be preparing, uh, praying for a friend of Erna Herman's, Jules, uh, who is recovering from surgery and is having some complications. Uh, we pray that Jules would, uh, that the Lord would put his healing hand upon Jules and that uh, the healing would be complete and would give him peace as well. We pray for Gary Rock, uh, Susan Euchre's uh, brother. Uh, We pray uh, certainly for Gary. Uh, He's been in the hospital. We pray for uh, healing and strength and peace. As I mentioned earlier, Russ Phillips uh, fell, uh, fractured his pelvis, uh, not in need of surgery, but is in need of rehabilitation. So we certainly pray for uh, Russ that uh, not only would God put his healing hand upon him, but that he would give him uh, clarity of mind. Uh, We pray for Joan Ferguson. Uh, Joan is back in the hospital with pneumonia. I spoke to her this week. Uh, She is having some other medical issues that she is having uh, checked out while she's there. So 
Uh, we pray for right discernment and treatment and for God's peace and healing to be with Joan. I spoke with Chris Graber this past week, and Chris is having trouble navigating as far as walking goes, so she is confined pretty much to the house. Uh, they do get her out occasionally. Uh, she was in good spirits, but recovering from a fall. So uh, we certainly pray for peace of mind for Chris and that God would heal her uh, and give her a clarity of mind to uh, understand her limitations uh, so that uh, she would remain healthy. We're also praying for Paul Okunyevsky. Uh, Paul, uh, one of our newer members here, uh, we're praying for healing after he took a spill off a ladder and uh, may have fractured his wrist, uh, but uh, we pray for healing uh, for Paul. We also pray for the family of Joyce Lynn. Uh, that's a neighbor of Paul and Bonnie Klosterman. Uh, Joyce Lynn was on her way to work uh, this past Monday and uh, was killed in a tragic car accident. She was 24 years old and they were expecting a child. So we certainly pray for her husband Austin and all of the family that God would wrap his loving arms around them. Heavenly Father, in thanksgiving for the eternal word made flesh and his dwelling among us, full of grace and truth, we ask that his praise would be extended into all the world and that all people would come to hope in his steadfast love. We pray for Christian homes that following the example of our Lord Jesus, all children would be diligent and open to hear the word of God, to grow in wisdom and stature, to obey their earthly parents and always be about the Heavenly Father's business and in his house. We pray for the church, blessed in Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We pray for the preaching of the gospel of salvation and the seal of the promised Holy Spirit in baptism and to raise up faithful preachers among us to proclaim Christ's glory until we acquire the inheritance promised us in him. We pray for the leaders and elected officials of our nation, especially for their wisdom that is God once gave his servant Servant Solomon, unsurpassed wisdom to rule in Israel, that he would also enable them to discern between good and evil and govern our people wisely. And Father, as we said, the list is long and the needs are many, and we pray for the sick and everyone in any kind of need, especially for those that we named, and now that for those that we name in our heart. We pray for patience and healing according to God's will in thanksgiving for every blessing and kindness shown to us in Christ. We pray for all those who come to the blessed sacrament this day that as Christ has won our redemption through his blood so that now according to the riches of his grace he would grant us repentant hearts, confident faith, and unity in a sincere confession. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of your Son who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. And we now join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, today's gospel lesson represents a somewhat of a unique snapshot. Luke gives us a glimpse of what Jesus was like as a small boy. 
Presumably, there are many things Luke could have told us about Jesus' childhood, but of all the things Jesus said and did in his first 30 years, this incident is the only one recorded in the Bible. None of the other gospel writers mention the young Jesus. Accordingly, this incident must have some special significance. So in the next few minutes, let's see what this passage tells us about Jesus and what lessons we can take away and apply to our lives. Luke begins by setting the stage and shifting the scene from Bethlehem and Jerusalem back to Nazareth. He doesn't mention the adoration of the Magi or the flight to Egypt as told in Matthew's gospel. Luke simply says that they returned to Nazareth. He then compresses Jesus' first 12 years into a single verse, saying, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Jesus grew and became strong just like all kids. I wouldn't be surprised if Mary and Joseph had a growth chart on a wall in the home in Nazareth. He crawled, sat up, learned to use his hands and feet, became a toddler, a little boy, and then almost before his parents knew it, a teenager. God the Son became a man, a real man, not just someone, <clears throat> excuse me, not just someone who only appeared to be a man. The author Ken Hughes noted, and I quote, when he was born, God the Son placed the exercise of his all-powerfulness, all-presence, and all-knowingness under the direction of God the Father. He did not give up those attributes, but he submitted their exercise in his life to his Father's discretion. Though he was sinless, he had a human mind, body, and emotions, complete with their inherent weakness. He was fully human and fully divine. Like his body, the mind of Christ had to develop too. Verse 52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom. Luke is telling us that the intellectual, moral, and spiritual growth of Jesus as a child was just as real as his physical growth. The Scottish theologian Donald MacLeod explained it this way. He had a human mind subject to the same laws of perception, memory, logic, and development as our own. He observed, learned, remembered, and applied. This would have been impossible if he had been born with, complete, with a complete body of wisdom and knowledge. Instead, he was born with the mental equipment of a normal child, experienced the normal stimuli, and went through the ordinary process of intellectual development." Close quote. The crucial difference here, though, is Jesus did it without sin. As Jesus grew in stature and his mind grew in wisdom, Jesus also grew in personal relationships with other people and with his Father God. Luke tells us in verse 40 that the favor of God was upon him, and in verse 52 that he increased in favor with God and with man. In between these two years, the story of Jesus uh, as a boy in, as a, in Jerusalem as a young boy. Luke probably heard the story from Mary. Going to Jerusalem was an annual occurrence for Jesus and his family. Luke tells us in verses 41 and 42 that his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Only Joseph was required to go, but as a godly family, so they all made the annual pil pilgrimage for Passover. Going to Jerusalem had to be a great adventure for a 12-year-old boy. There was an 80-mile hike just to get there, which in itself had to be exciting. And then to see the streets of Jerusalem crammed with 200,000 people and 100,000 sheep for sacrifices. The sights and sounds had to be exciting for everyone who attended, but especially for a 12-year-old young man. He would have joined the others to go up to the temple and to pray and to sing psalms. And on the night of the Passover, he would have worshiped with his family. As his father prepared the sacrificial lamb, Jesus would have heard the story of the salvation all over again. Jesus would have reminded, Joseph would have reminded Jesus how God had rescued his people from slavery and delivered them from the death in, in Egypt. This would all have had a special significance the year Jesus turned 12. In another year, he would be 13, the age at which a young man became a full member of the synagogue. The rabbi said that when a boy turned 12, 
it was time for him to go to Jerusalem with his father and learn the rituals of the Passover. This was the year for him to learn what it meant to be a man. But it was also the year of the mix-up. Here again how Luke describes it in verse 43 through 45. And when the feast had ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it, but supposing him to be in the group went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And as far as, far as Mary and Joseph were concerned, Jesus was lost. Today we'd have an amber alert. As I mentioned earlier, it was about an 80-mile journey back to Nazareth. For safety purposes, people would travel together in a caravan. Mary and Joseph had assumed that Jesus was with other friends within that group. Now, I don't know about you, but I panic when I can't find my wallet and my phone. I can't imagine the fear and terrifying thoughts that a parent has when their child is missing. I have a friend in Florida, however, who has experienced those thoughts. He's a pastor, and years ago when he was the associate pastor for families at a church outside of Chattanooga, he returned from making hospital visits, only meeting his wife, or meeting his secretary, telling him very, very sternly, he had to call home. When the phone was answered, all he heard on the other end was his wife giving the description of their young daughter to the police. My friend dropped the phone, took off, and headed home. He would tell you today that that short drive was the longest trip of his life. Turning the corner onto his street, there were police cars with flashing lights, EMTs, and neighbors all over the lawn. And all his wife said was, I can't find her. Well, to make a long story short, all turned out fine. The little girl had been playing hide and seek, hid behind some furniture and fell asleep, and nobody knew where to find her. But even today, some 20 years later, my friend David still tears up when he tells the story and the feelings of fear come back top on him. This must be how Mary and Joseph felt. In Luke's story, however, did you notice in verse 43 where he says, he stayed behind? I get the impression that this was a conscious decision. Jesus chose to remain in Jerusalem at the temple. He wanted to learn as much as he could about the scriptures. He was drawn to the house of God. He wanted to stay in the presence of his heavenly father. So after three days of searching, Mary and Joseph found Jesus in the first place they should have looked. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So Jesus was essentially in a seminar in the temple courts with learned theologians. He was listening to them and asking them questions. This was the style of theological instruction in those days. Students questioned their rabbis to learn what they had to teach. So it is natural that a boy would sit at the feet of his teachers to learn. Luke tells us that when Mary and Joseph found him, they were astonished and Mary said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Mary's question came from her fear. Jesus answered, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? That's verse 49. It's interesting to note that those were the first words of Jesus Christ that are recorded in the Bible. They were, this revealed his true identity as the Son of God. And the temple is right where Jesus was supposed to be. After this, Jesus went with Mary and Joseph back to Nazareth. And in verse 52, Luke tells us, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There's that word again, wisdom. This story from Luke begins and ends with Jesus growing in wisdom. Well, is there a lesson there for us? How did Jesus grow in wisdom? And how do we do that too? How do we follow Jesus' pattern of growing in wisdom? Well, to begin with, what is wisdom? It's more than just head knowledge. It's more than just learned facts and figures. Wisdom is taking what we've learned and applying it to life. 
Jesus learned God's truth and applied it to real life. We should do the same. In our culture, we are led to believe that we gain wisdom in isolation. I have to retreat by myself with a bunch of books and read a lot, and then I'll be wise. Or, I will grow in wisdom by doing life my own way. Or, if I can only avoid pain and suffering, I will be able to grow in wisdom. That's what our society would tell us today. But in this passage, we're taught just the opposite. Jesus shows us how true wisdom grows in community, in obedience, and through our personal trials. Jesus didn't gain wisdom in isolation. Sure, I'm quite certain that he took time to study alone, but Luke shows that Jesus grew in wisdom because of the theological communities he was part of. First of all, these communities challenged Jesus. The 80-mile hike was for, to Jerusalem was a challenge. But even though his parents were poor, they took on that challenge with neighbors and families and made that journey. Why? Because devotion to God and being, his, being with his people was worth the challenge. This is just one example. Jesus grew in wisdom because he grew up in a family and in a community that was faithful to God, no matter the challenge. When Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, he wasn't sitting under a tree reading the Bible. He wasn't playing stickball with a bunch of the boys, was he? He was in a challenging theological community discussing the Bible. And how did he participate in that group? Luke said that he listened and he asked questions. That's how he grew in wisdom. One of the themes of the book of Proverbs is that only a fool enjoys expressing his opinion, but the wise man listens and asks questions. Do you know what the word disciple means? It represents the Greek word mathedia, which generally means one who engages in learning through instruction from another. In Latin, it's disciplus, which means learner. That is the basis of a discussion. That's really all one needs to learn. Good, solid discussion. My experience is that, which, that that's what you find here at Grace. In Sunday school classes or Bible studies, good discussion led by people who want to help us all learn in a community within the church. Remember a moment ago when we heard about Mary and Joseph finding Jesus in the temple and Jesus saying, <clears throat> why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Here the emphasis, uh, emphasis is on who was Jesus, Jesus' father. Where does Jesus' ultimate loyalty lie? What Jesus is saying is that in some ways, staying behind was an act of obedience to his heavenly father. It was necessary. The father's will comes first. Jesus is teaching us that wisdom is not just the accumulation of knowledge. A wise person is not someone who knows a lot about the Bible. A wise person is someone who actually applies what they know from the Bible. A wise person is someone who not only knows God's truth, but applies God's truth no matter what. A wise person is someone who knows God's truth and applies it in a way that is in accordance with the will of God. Friends, you don't grow muscles by reading a lot of books about weightlifting. What do we need to do? Lift some weights. We grow by applying what we know to what we do. What do, you know, what do you know that you need to apply in order to grow? Luke shows us that when Jesus left with his parents to return home, he was submissive to them. His emphasis is on the submissive obedience of Jesus to both fathers, his heavenly father and his earthly father. The path to true wisdom is doing what you want, is not doing what you want. It's doing what God wants, even if nobody understands. I must pray. I must serve. I must read the Bible. I must. It's the will of God. Practice submissive observations and application. And finally, I think this passage, we learn that wisdom grows when we go through trials. We don't want to hear that we do. We don't want to avoid, we want to avoid suffering, don't we? That's why so many people go to Florida in the winter. We're go, who's going through pain in Luke's story today? Mary and Joseph, right? Mary's question in verse 48, where she says, son, why have you treated us so? Reflects her pain. That's the question we ask too. 
Why did my business have to fail? Why did I lose my job? God, why is this happening to me? Sometimes the only way Jesus can teach us is by taking us through trials and difficult times. Some of you may know that last March I had a large mass removed from my abdomen that proved to be cancerous. But what did I learn from that experience, from that trial? What I learned is what it's like to hear those words is malignant. Reflecting on that now, I know I have a much better understanding of the emotions someone encounters when they are diagnosed with cancer. Before, I could sympathize and express my sorrow to someone, but now I have learned just what it feels like to really have to deal with the reality of that diagnosis. I'm better able to serve, perhaps to minister to that person. I'm wiser than before. I couldn't learn what it feels like to hear those words just by reading a book. We don't just solve the problems of life with wisdom. The problems of life are also the way we get wisdom. Friends, Luke has shown us today that the fruit of wisdom grows on the branches of community, obedience, and trials. It's a new year, a fresh start. Is this a year your wisdom will grow? I pray that it is, and that Jesus' model will be one that we look to. Amen. join together with it for our closing song within the father's house God's blessing and benediction as we go into our day. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be God. Have a great week, everybody.